Welcome to the Christian Mysticism Podcast, where we explore the fascinating history of Christian mysticism from the early days of the church until today. I'm Alberto de la Cruz, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Carlos Ayer, the T. Lawson Riggs Professor of History and Religious Studies at Yale University. Carlos, once again, great to hear your voice and to have you on the show. It's wonderful to be on the show and to hear your voice too, as always. As our listeners have probably figured out now, and we've posted on our podcast website, we do a show on the first and third Thursday of every month, and some months have five Thursdays in them. So it was about a three-week hiatus between our last conversation and, and this show. So it's good to be back in the saddle. Yeah. And uh, for me, it's good to be on summer vacation too. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's summertime. And also, this is our 13th episode, so it's our lucky 13. Wow. incredible. You know, a semester so, only lasts 13 weeks. And um, I lecture, of course, on, on these topics that we've been dealing with sometimes for, you know, two lectures each. So 26, we're about halfway. <laughs> yeah, halfway through the year. This is exactly the halfway point because... No, actually, the halfway point was the episode before, because if we're doing uh, two episodes a month, then it would right. be 24. So the two, that was the halfway point. So now we're in the second half of our first year or our first season, as we like to call it. So in our last episode, we talked about the physical phenomena of mysticism and the different mystics that have experienced things like stigmata, levitation, bilocation. But today we're going to talk about one that almost experienced all of those physical yep. phenomena. He had a full range of physical experiences. I don't think there's any individual who has had all of the phenomena throughout their life, but Francis uh, comes close. And actually he was the, the first to receive the stigmata. So he is a pioneer. So today we're talking about St. Francis of Assisi. So tell us, who was he? Uh, St. Francis lived in a very turbulent time, and uh, of course, in Assisi, Italy, which was one of these very prosperous city-states in central Italy, closer to the north than to the south. It's north of Rome. And uh, born in 1182, why was this a troubled time? And what was the deal with, you know, being born in Assisi? Well, there were two major heresies affecting all of Western Christendom, but they were uh, a special, they had an especially heavy presence in parts of Italy, so nearby Assisi. Francis's mysticism cannot be separated, can't be understood without understanding the context of, you know, where he lived and what happened, because this is so true of every human being, right? What we end up doing with our lives is intimately connected with what is happening around us. So Francis was a unique mystic who didn't write much, but there was so much written about him. And he established a religious order that was so important, so significant in the history of the Catholic Church that his mystical experiences became part and parcel of Catholic culture in a way that the experiences of, of other mystics who wrote much, much more, that they ended up not being as well known as Francis. So this is one of the reasons that he's significant. He's also significant because those around him who wrote about his life looked at him as the one human being who had come closest to imitating the life of Christ. And we can get into that, of course, in a little while. What did he do? How did he imitate the life of Christ? But there are very few mystics who had as much to say about the goodness of creation, the goodness of nature, the goodness of God, but also paradoxically, very few other mystics experienced as much pain and joy simultaneously as Francis. Because if you think about what the gift of the stigmata is, you get wounds, real wounds, bleeding wounds, painful wounds on your hands, feet, and side. And yet 
Francis and everyone around him and all stigmatists ever since have considered it a wonderful gift. So how paradoxical is that? And uh, here's a man who loved nature, the goodness of nature, and yet he called his own body brother ass or brother donkey. And he's why, why, why would he say that? Well, because like a donkey, you know, very stubborn donkeys have to be abused somewhat to get them to do what you want them to do. So he abused his body horrifically. And there's the paradox. Here's a man who spoke of all of nature as brother this or sister that, you know, brother sun, sister moon. Now, well, we'll, we'll read his canticle of the sun in, in, in a little while, but brother sun, sister moon, his own body was brother ass. It seems to me and to many others who have read uh, about his life, the hagiographies, that, that he uh, kind of permanently damaged his digestive system through excessive fasting. So how, how do you reconcile these things? It's kind of puzzling. But of course, that's what mysticism is. It's very puzzling. So what were these heresies that were going on at the time that really shaped his, his life and his history? Yeah, well, our listeners, if they um, remember, or if they listen to our podcast on St. Augustine, will hear an echo of that now, because the cosmic dualism that Augustine encountered, and actually he became a Manichaean for a while, you know, the very idea that the world, the physical world, the material world, and our bodies were created by an evil deity, and that our real selves are spirit trapped in our bodies, trapped in this awful material world. That never fully went away. It came back. It came back in the um, 11th century and progressed to a point where there were entire parts of Western Europe that became fully heretical. The name given to this heresy is two names. It's either called the Cathar heresy from it's related to the word catharsis, you know, to be, to be cleansed. The Cathar, they considered themselves pure. But it's also known as the Albigensian heresy because one of their chief strongholds in what is now southern France was the town of Albi, A-L-B-I. So Albigensians or Cathars, the same thing. And much of what is now southern France, uh, northeastern Spain, parts of Italy, and even up down the Rhine River through German-speaking areas. Cathars became very, very numerous and actually supplanted the Catholic Church. And it was especially in, in what is now southern France that they had their greatest strongholds and where, according to some accounts, the Catholic Church ceased to exist. Let me ask you before you go further, what was the era that this was taking place in? It was, uh, well, the Cathars, the people who became Cathars, started becoming numerous in the 11th century, so in the 10 hundreds, right? Exactly 1,000 years ago. And by the 12th century, when Francis is born in 1182, oh, they're all over the place. And where did they get this idea? Well, it came, the Manichaean heresy never fully died. It survived in what we now call the Near East, and very slowly and gradually it made its way back west and became very popular. And you have to ask yourself, well, why did it become popular? And that's one of the keys to understanding Francis's mysticism. It became popular because the Cathar clergy, let's call them that, although they didn't call themselves this, that church was set up pretty much the same way the Manichaean heresy was set up in Augustine's day because they believed in reincarnation. One could never become saved, let's put it that way, using a Christian term. What was salvation? Salvation was getting out of this world and returning to the spirit realm. But that couldn't happen in a single lifetime. You had to go through many, many lifetimes. And their clergy were, were men who were considered to be in the final stages of their reincarnation process. And they were close to perfect, and they were actually called perfecti, the perfect. And in many respects, were like Christian monks. They were celibate. They, unlike Christian monks, all the perfect were not only celibate, 
but vegetarians. And they went around in pairs preaching and teaching this dualism. This is what a religion like this ends up being called dualism because they believe that there are, you know, two competing divine principles, one good, one evil. And their preaching involved traveling from town to town, being celibate, being vegetarians, and having absolutely no property. And uh, this seemed very appealing to many people, or so we're told. Did these Cathars have any ties to Hinduism or Buddhism? Because it, because it sounds like you're describing, you know, vegetarian, believe in reincarnation. Yeah, uh, long, long term, yes. The, the, you know, the original source of much of this is Asian. But, you know, Manichaeans, their founder, Mani, was from Persia, present day Iran. And it is mostly from present day Iran that it moved back westwards and ended up in places like southern France, Italy, and northeast Spain. So, yeah, you can trace, there's a smoking gun that you can trace way back right? But they didn't have ties with Buddhists or Hindus. No. And they, they considered themselves Christians because, you know, they supplanted the Christian church. Uh, what role did Christ play? Well, Christ, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to say because no, very, so very few Cathar documents have survived that most of what we know about them comes from the people who wiped them out. Christ was, you know, pure spirit, his body was not real. It was kind of like a hologram. <laughs> and the appeal of Catharism or Albigensianism, a great part of it was this whole poverty thing of these clerics who were very far from being corrupt, like so many Christian clergy had become wealthy and corrupt and very materially focused. They were looked up to. And, um, well, in 1208, so let's do the math. Uh, Francis is born in 1182, so 18 plus 8, 26. When Francis was 26, Pope Innocent III called for a crusade against the Cathars and a horrible, lengthy campaign. War, actually, was launched against the Cathars. And who were these crusaders? Well, they were mostly from the north, especially northern France, who descended on the south and began what is known as the Albigensian Crusade. And by force, reconquered these areas for the Catholic Church. And there are many horrible stories about how this war was carried out. But Francis, of course, everybody knew about all this. And Francis, it's, we don't have a smoking gun here. Did Francis ever hang out with Cathars? <laughs> we don't know, but he knew about them. And he actually modeled himself. He learned a lot by observing, or, or at least knowing about this Cathar predilection for poverty and asceticism, which was so popular. And then this might help us to start to get to understand Francis's mysticism and his commitment to poverty, absolute poverty, right? And an absolute commitment to some of the sayings of Jesus, the, his hardest sayings, you know, about giving up everything and following him and not even, you know, having care, go and preach, go out, do all these things I've been doing and take no money with you. <laughs> Eat whatever they serve you, people. And if they don't receive you, you know, shake the dust off your feet. That's what Francis set himself out to do, which was in many ways very similar to what the Cathars were doing. In the background or in the horizon, we have to keep in mind that in many places, the church had become very wealthy. And many clergy, including monks, were not really observing their rules. And there was all sorts of corruption. Francis is an attempt to clean all this up. The other heresy, known as the Waldensians, after their founder, Peter Waldo, called themselves the poor men. Very similar, very similar to the Cathars, except they were not dualists. They, they didn't believe 
that there were two deities and that the material world was evil. But they insisted that the church needed to be poor, and especially the clergy needed to be poor. And the Waldensians, the poor men, as they were called, also ended up being chased into remote areas. They were never like the uh, Albigensians. The, the war was waged on them, but they were not wiped out. They actually survived in the Alps. And uh, there were many Waldensians in Italy. And actually one of the places where they survived was Northern Italy in the Alps. Francis knew about the Waldensians too. So both of these heresies, very popular, viewed as very dangerously popular by the Catholic Church, Francis is an answer to them. Francis is a good Catholic who harnesses this preoccupation with poverty, simplicity, following the gospel closely, and harnesses it, and those who follow him become instrumental in defeating these two heresies, not by war or persecution, but simply by example and by preaching, just like the Cathars and Waldensians did. Preaching is, is the important thing. We also have to keep in mind that, uh, you know, back in this time period, preaching was very irregular in churches. And this was, this was a, in many ways, an innovation to, to preach to lay people regularly and to, in the preaching to teach them values, ethics, as well as theology. So Francis, to get to his story, his father is a very successful cloth merchant and has funds. <laughs> he comes from a privileged family. And like many young men in Assisi and all the other city states of Italy, he's very much a party animal <laughs> and also wants to, you know, be a hero, wants to be, wants to be a, a knight and, and a soldier. And he goes off to war against another town, nearby town, but he becomes ill. And during this illness, he is transformed. He has mystical experiences, has a conversion experience of some sort. Whereas before, you know, he was very uh, fond of reading chivalric literature uh, about, you know, knights in, in armor and ladies in distress. And, you know, in chivalric culture, these knights, they pledge themselves to a lady and they do heroic things for the lady. Well, Francis comes back from his war experience, not just ill, but he's had a conversion. He now wants to pledge himself to lady poverty. And he drives his parents to utter despair because he, he starts to act strangely and all this talk about lady poverty. And he, he goes off by himself to pray and he has mystical experiences and he comes back preaching to people about poverty. And he also has an experience at a tiny little chapel just outside the, down at the, Assisi is on a, on a very high, rocky, we would call it a mountain, but uh, in the Midwest of the United States, they'd certainly call it a mountain, but it's a tall hill down at the bottom of the, the hill at the church of San Damiano, which was uh, a little chapel that had fallen into disrepair. He goes in there to pray and he has this, experience where the crucifix, which was a, an old crucifix, had been there for quite some time. The art historians usually refer to it as Byzantine style or, you know, Greek Orthodox style. It's a painted crucifix, right? There's, it's not a three-dimensional crucifix and Christ is two-dimensional. Well, the crucifix at San Damiano begins to speak to Francis. And what Francis hears, the crucifix, uh, Jesus say to him is, Francis, take up to the repair of my church, which has fallen to ruin. And Francis interprets it literally and thinks that Jesus is ordering him to fix the chapel of San Damiano. So <laughs> he, he starts using his father's funds 
and his father gets very upset, you know, to buy materials to repair San Damiano. And his father finally uh, has had too much of this. So he goes to the bishop and, and he asks the bishop to intercede and, you know, talk some sense into his son. And then there's this dramatic scene where Francis's father and Francis and other people are there with the bishop and the bishop is trying to talk sense into St. Francis. And Francis strips off all his clothing, stands there buck naked and says, I now have only one father, my heavenly father. So he rejects his own father and strips himself of everything he owns including his clothes. And then he goes about preaching and, and teaching in Assisi and people think he is crazy, but he starts to pick up followers. So he's got no plan and he keeps having these uh, ecstasies and, and visions and mystical experiences. And he begins to attract followers and he insists that they all have to practice absolute poverty, just like Jesus and the apostles. And this is how his religious order begins. The interesting twist in the story is that, of course, back in you know in the 1200s, still you know if you if you're going to start a religious order, you need permission from the church, and it has to be approved by the pope. So the pope at this time has a dream, and in this dream, a raggedy little beggar is holding up Saint Peter's Basilica, which is uh, crumbling and about to fall. He hadn't heard of Francis. Parent, this is how the story goes. So when um, he finally does hear about Francis and he shows up to get permission to establish his religious order, the Pope realizes that the little beggar he had seen in his dream was Francis. So there we go, the story of San Damiano being fixed. No, it wasn't, the crucifix wasn't telling Francis to repair San Damiano. He was telling him to repair the whole church which had fallen to ruin. And what is the ruin? The ruin is all the wealth, the corruption, and the places lost to heretics like the Albigensians and the Waldensians who observed absolute poverty. So he, he makes the whole poverty thing very Catholic. And in all of this, he also begins to have this close connection to nature while practicing extreme asceticism, extreme self-denial, and, and so do his followers. The success of Francis, because he starts to attract hundreds of followers, and his order grows by leaps and bounds and spreads all over Europe eventually. Francis is all about humility, poverty, self-denial, being the lowest of the low, and here now, he is supposed to, he's written a rule for his order, which calls for strict, absolute poverty. Now, how do you have a religious order with hundreds and eventually thousands of members with no place to live? <laughs> well, this eventually unravels and creates all sorts of problems. And poor Francis, he just can't, he can't mix these two things, being in charge and being humble. There's one story about Francis that I have always found perhaps the most extreme. And it goes something like this. This is, uh, shows you the, the humility of Francis and also his very paradoxical attitude towards his own body. One of his closest followers and personal friend, brother Leo. Well, one time they're praying out, and this is it. Uh, Francis loves to pray out, out in the open in nature. They're out somewhere praying, and Francis suddenly says to Leo, Leo, if I order you to do something, will you do it? He says, yes, I'm supposed to. I'm supposed to obey you. He says, okay, I want you to step on my neck and tell me I am the worst sinner on earth. And Leo, of course, says, I can't do that. He says, I just ordered you to. So here, come step on my neck several times and tell me I am the worst sinner on earth. And Leo does it. Now, there are many contemporaries who thought that Francis was insane. 
but many more didn't think he was insane. They just took this as this behavior, as holiness. And Francis has many, many ecstasies that are witnessed by his followers. And perhaps that's what we, we can get into more telling examples of what Franciscan mysticism is, is all about. I was going to ask, because you mentioned at the beginning that he didn't do a lot of writing, but there was a lot written about him. Who were some of the, uh, were there known authors that wrote about him from that era? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, the, the, the first three lives of, of Francis, the first two especially, were written by someone who was a contemporary of Francis, Thomas of Solano. And then a, a third life, uh, he wrote two, two lives, one longer than the other. The third life was written by Saint Bonaventure, who was himself a Franciscan and actually ended up being the, the head of the Franciscan order, one of the greatest scholastic theologians of the Middle Ages, which, you know, a little footnote, whoa, what's, he's a scholastic theologian, wait a minute, these men were supposed to be totally poor and preaching all the time. Well, Franciscans end up in all the universities, and some of the greatest theologians of the later Middle Ages will be Franciscans. They decide to make, after Francis, actually even before he dies, his followers make compromises on the total poverty issue, but then they end up having disagreements with each other about. So the lives are written, the lives are written, not just for the Franciscans who follow Francis and belong to his order, but for lay people to know about this great saint who came so close to imitating Christ perfectly. Bonaventure writes a life in which the, the whole poverty issue is finessed. But then a hundred years after Francis's life, another hagiography is written, supposedly based on oral traditions, more than what's already been written. Oral traditions passed down over a whole century about things that Francis did. It's known as the Little Flowers of St. Francis, the Fioretti. And there you have some of the most marvelous stories about Francis, the nature mystic, and Francis, the man who more than any, the, the little flowers of St. Francis is very clear. They make no, they don't try to soften the message at all. Francis was the human being who has come closest to imitating Christ and being kind of a second Christ figure. And we can get into some of those stories maybe in a, in a little while. But Francis' health deteriorates as he ages, and eventually he, he gives up control of his own order. And by that time, the whole poverty issue has become very divisive among his followers. But it is towards the end of his life that he has the strangest and most unique mystical experience that anyone up to that time has had in Christian history. And that is his, his receives the, the stigmata while praying outdoors. Christ appears to him, but a very weird image. He's on a cross and has six wings, two wings above the shoulders, two wings parallel to the shoulders, and two wings below the shoulders. And as he is having this ecstatic vision, he receives the wounds of Christ. He becomes a mirror image of Christ. And that's the gift of the stigmata. In the early accounts, the stigmata are not holes. He actually has some growths that look like nails sticking out of his feet and hands. He actually does have a gash in his side. But at first, Francis tries to hide this from everyone, but by, you know, he can't hide something like that. And eventually everybody around him knows uh, that he has this gift, which is bizarre and startles people. But by the time you get to the Little Flowers of St. Francis, written a hundred years after he lived, they're no longer protrusions that look like nails or anything. They're holes. But in the Little Flowers, it's pretty clear that this is the ultimate sign that, you know, it's bestowed on him by Christ is to have a body like his, a wounded body. Now, often when, when you know, I, I teach about St. Francis, I uh, will have some students who find them too scary. This is not the nature mystic, friendly 
St. Francis, who talks about brother sun, sister moon, brother wind. No, this is a very scary man. So yeah, he's a paradox. He's a paradox. And since he wrote so little, we have to rely on what others have said about him to sort of reconstruct what his mysticism was all about, which is very much about being Christ-like, right? And this absolute commitment to poverty and to self-mortification. But at the very same time, nature, nature, nature. Two examples, two stories. The first is Francis and the birds. He and some of his companions are out, out in the open again, and uh, they want to they want to pray. It's time, the time to pray the hours, as all monastics do. But the birds around them are, are really noisy. And Francis says, oh, the dear little birds, look, they're praying to God too. That's their prayer. That's their prayer to God. But then he turns to the birds and says, oh, dear birds, uh, could you be quiet? <laughs> we, we can't say our prayers by because of the your prayers, the noise you're making. So could you just be quiet for a little while and let us say our prayers? And um, yeah, the birds quiet down and they say their prayers, Francis and his companions. And then the birds start singing again. And Francis says, there you are brothers, you know, brother birds. Yeah, resume your prayers to God. So nature itself is offering prayer to God in Francis's mystical universe, right? And then there's another story from the little flowers. It's my favorite story. You don't find it in the other lives of Francis. You only find it in the little flowers. The town of Gubbio, also, you know, near, near Assisi, uh, there's a, a mean old wolf who is not just killing sheep and goats. He's actually killing humans. And the town of Gubbio is, is terrified by this wolf. So, they call on St. Francis because they know about his, you know, his touch with nature. And Francis uh, shows up and um, he says, where's this wolf? Uh, and he goes to meet with the wolf. And of course, there are eyewitnesses. So goes the story. Before he meets with the wolf, though, he has done something significant. He has uh, asked the town people, would you be willing to feed this wolf? He says, well, if that's how we can get rid of him. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing, but this story is just too funny. And it's, it's a very moving story if you, if you, you know, think what, what the message is. So Francis meets with the wolf and talks to him and says, Dear wolf, you, you shouldn't be killing people and you shouldn't be killing their livestock. These people are going to feed you every day. Do you promise to stop killing if they feed you? And at that point, the wolf raises his paw and shakes Francis's hand with his paw in agreement. And from that day forward, the townspeople feed the wolf every day. And get this, the wolf basically becomes a Franciscan because he goes door to door begging for food. And that's how he obtains the food from the townspeople who grow very fond of the wolf. And actually when the wolf dies, they're all heartbroken. <laughs> oh, the wolf is gone. Oh, but Francis takes a predatory animal, right? And predation is one of the things that upset the Cathars and the Manichaeans so much. How could a good God create animals that eat each other and eat humans too? That's not a good God. Francis takes nature, this wolf, and turns him into not just the Franciscan, but turns him basically into something he is not. He's no longer a predator. But in the process, the paradoxical fact is that these townspeople are feeding him meat, <laughs> right? But he's not killing anything. So somehow nature is partly redeemed of this. There's an ad admission in all in this story. This is why I like it so much. There's an admission that nature is cruel. Francis calls him Brother Wolf, right? Brother Wolf. Brother Wolf might eat you. That's acknowledged. As a matter of fact, this particular wolf had been killing people. So nature is somehow partially redeemed. And if you just focus on the paradox as one must with all these mystical figures like Francis, there's a bit of coincidence of opposites. And you've got a sort of redemption that's not complete redemption, but 
nonetheless, nature is transformed. And Francis's followers too, in the stories told about them, they, they have a great deal of bonding with nature. Another Franciscan story that doesn't involve Francis himself, but one of his uh, followers, St. Anthony of Padua. St. Anthony is, is sent to preach against Albigensians, but the Albigensians don't listen to him. They chase him away. So frustrated, he goes to the seashore and starts preaching to the waves. And gradually fish begin to show up and poke their heads out of the water and they listen to St. Anthony's sermon. Now, did something like that happen? Highly unlikely, but it's, it's the, the moral of the story is that nature itself can accept St. Anthony, the Franciscan preacher, whereas these hard-hearted human heretics cannot. Nature is on the side of the Franciscans. The Franciscans are on the side of nature itself because what the Cathars are denying is that nature can have any good in it. It's all evil. So the story of St. Anthony and the fish, not quite the same as the story of Wolf of Gubbio, but Wolf of Gubbio too, many experts think, no, of course that didn't happen. One of the latest biographies of Francis to be published, oh, no, no, it's maybe about 10 years old, actually says, no, no, this, this could not have happened. But for me, without the Wolf of Gubbio, St. Francis is not St. Francis. Well, at least now we know why you find St. Francis of Assisi statues and garden centers. That's right. That's right. And uh, actually, I think it's very funny because people who are not Catholics buy those statues and put them in their gardens. I think it's very difficult to go to a garden center where you don't find a little concrete statue of St. Francis. Uh, some of them pretty tacky, but that's beside the point. Francis would have loved the tacky ones. I'm and, sure he, he would have. Uh, yeah, the, and the, the cheaper and uglier, the better. Exactly. The more <laughs> the more poverty looking, the, the better he would have liked it. But we talked yes. about, in terms of, of St. Francis and his mysticism, we talked about the stigmata, but he had a lot of other mystical experiences as well. Yes. One of the, the most profound is, I think it was Brother Leo, one of his close companions, found them praying at night. He prayed constantly, but found him saying the following over and over and over again. My God, my God, what are you? What am I? Over and over again. What are you? What am I? What are you? What am I? Basic existential question which apparently was being resolved for him in some way that you know he never wrote it down so we don't know but this total identification with christ in lifestyle right in behavior there's nothing profoundly theological in a scholastic sense there's no message detailed message being given about christ's divinity and humanity other than imitation. There's no uh, attempt here to struggle with the fine points of theology, of how Christ can be divine and human at the same time. There's just simply a very, very forceful message. Imitate him, imitate him. And don't care about things, belongings, wealth, fame. Abase yourself, right? Feel sorry for your sins. Consider it, the, the story with Brother Leo stepping on his neck. Look at your own sinfulness and try to, you know, wipe out everything that is bad in you. It's a transformative mystical message that he that Francis has for everybody is transform yourself and, you know, care for the poor. Poverty, it's lady poverty, right? It's, it's, it's poverty is a, a, a Christian virtue. And... In our uh, day and age, I can think of somebody who um, imitated Francis, although she was not Franciscan. She started her own order is Mother Teresa of Calcutta, who is now um, has been canonized and is Saint Teresa of Calcutta, a Portuguese woman who went to India and, you know, lived with the poor for the poor. And there's another uh, charming story, you know, 
again, lives of Christian saints are a lot like mirror images, almost like entering into one of those uh, house of mirrors that they used to have at carnivals. Because Teresa of Calcutta imitates Francis uh, thoroughly. And I, I don't remember where this happened, but it's it's been documented that at some city, someone donated a very nice building or house for Teresa's nuns. And she wouldn't let them have it because it was too nice. Too nice and too far removed from the poor people that they were there to serve. And Francis was pretty much like that too. So St. Francis experienced levitation, bilocation, all these other mystical experiences during his ecstasies. Tell us a little bit about those. Yeah, well, he was um, seen levitating quite a few times and uh, not just hovering off the ground, but actually uh, getting pretty far up and uh, glowing while he levitated, which is something that becomes much more common with levitators uh, later in the 16th, 17th century. He also bilocated several times. And, you know, there are very few medieval paintings of medieval saints levitating, but St. Francis has them. Uh, Giotto, the great painter who decorated the entire Basilica of St. Francis in Assisi with uh, paintings of scenes from Francis's life, depicts him levitating and glowing and surrounded by a cloud. He also bilocated a few times, not very often. We don't have that many bilocation stories, but again, very typical. While in ecstasy in place A, he shows up in place B because his presence is needed. And one of these occasions was that the Franciscans, his followers, members now of his order, were meeting in Aro in the south of France, and his presence was needed, and he just simply showed up. He also had this, uh, how should I put this? Because this manifests itself also in other mystics, uh, this uncanny supernatural ability to know how to deal with individuals, almost as if he could read their thoughts. And that's another one of these, uh, you know, is it a physical phenomenon to have modern term, which would never have been used in the Middle Ages, telepathy? Well, yeah, sure. And um, another 20th century saint, this one Franciscan, Padre Pio. Cap he was a Capuchin. Capuchins are a branch of the Franciscan order. Padre Pio could not only read people's minds, but he often... Uh, heard confessions for hours and hours a day. And there were long lines of people who went to confess with Padre Pio because he acquired this reputation for actually knowing how to handle your, your sins and your problems. We have testimonies from many individuals who went to confess to Padre Pio. And um, after they got through telling him all their sins, he would say, well, I, I can't absolve you. Why? Because you're not telling me the whole story. And then, uh, you know, individuals might hem and haw, but then the testimonies of many people who this, this happened to, they say that he then told me what my hidden sins were and told them to me in such great detail with such great accuracy that he knew. And, you know, he had never met this person before and this person had never met Padre Pio before, yet he was able to know what was going on inside them. Uh, Francis had some of this. But, you know, some of these mystical gifts uh, develop over time in Christian history, like the stigmata. After Francis, other saints begin to get this gift, including Padre Pio, who died in 1968. So levitating, glowing, bilocating, being able to see what's inside people's hearts and minds. But on the other side, you know, you have to look at the whole picture and the paradox that Francis died young. Of course, back then, the lifespan for most people was much shorter than it is now. But he suffered greatly physically also from illnesses. And many experts think that he uh, actually had, towards the end of his life, had glaucoma, you know, very painful eye problem. So 
like Julian of Norwich, who prayed for an illness that it would almost kill her, or Teresa of Avila, who had all these illnesses, mystery illnesses, right, uh, including being paralyzed for a while. There's a lot of mystery about place of suffering and illness as being part of the redemption package. You know, these individuals, they embrace it. They don't run away from it. They actually embrace it, which I find, you know, that's why some of my students find France is very scary. <laughs> uh, you know, in all these conversations we've had about the mystics and the effects that their ecstasies have on their physical bodies, you can't help but to think that the human body really is not designed to be going back and forth between this world and the other world. It's almost like the mysticism is taking a physical toll on them. Yeah, although some some live uh, very long lives. But yes, you're right. Therese, Teresa of Avila, for one, described returning from her ecstasies as very physically painful that left all her joints aching. For days and days, she would say afterwards, sometimes she would have a difficulty picking up her quill to write with. So yeah, this is this is definitely part of the complex and very, I know I keep using the term over and over again, paradoxical conjoining of, of opposites, you know, ecstasy, pain, illness. And actually there's one 18th century mystic. This is a funny levitation story. Alfonso Liguori, an Italian saint, 18th century. He lived a long time. And towards the end of his life, he was um, unable to walk on his own. He was even so frail that he couldn't say mass. And he was very upset about this. So one day he's in a wheelchair and he's being wheeled about by a young priest. And actually, you know, saints can complain. Liguori is, is feeling bad about not being able to say mass. He's not actually complaining about his illness, but complaining about the fact he can't say mass anymore. And the young priest actually leans over to whisper some comforting words in his ear, something like, oh, you might not be able to say mass, but just keep saying, oh, I love you, God. And uh, Alfonso goes into a ecstatic experience and levitates right off his chair, hitting the, his head, hits the young priest in the chin and knocks him over. <laughs> and the story goes something like this. The young priest said that from, from that day forward, he tried not to lean over St. Alphonsus's chair, wheelchair, because he didn't want to get knocked down by a levitation again. So sometimes these things get funny. Well, you got to be able to laugh. Yes, you have to. And there's a there are saints who were mystics who are known for, you know, being very cheerful and making other people laugh. One of them is uh, St. Philip Neri, 16th century saint, who was known for his good sense of humor and his ability to make people have a, a joyful time while they were with him. And um, St. Francis says it's a little harder to read in this respect. He was just so uh, awesome. You know, he inspired awe sometimes inspired fear in people. Well, his, his story is definitely inspiring. And I know you mentioned early on in this podcast about his Canticle of the Sun. So why don't we, yes. why don't we close off with that? Yeah, why don't we do that? St. Francis the Nature Mystic wrote the Canticle of the Sun, also known as the um, Praise of the Creatures. And it begins like this. It's very long. I won't read all of it, but enough to give our listeners an idea of how beautiful this prayer is. Most high, all powerful, all good Lord, all praise is yours, all glory, all honor, and all blessings. To you, most high, do they belong, and no mortal lips are worthy to pronounce your name. Praise be you, my Lord, with all your creatures, especially Brother Son, who is the day through whom you give us light. And he is beautiful and radiant with great splendor. Of you, Most High, he bears the likeness. 
Praise be to you, Lord, through Sister Moon and the stars. In the heavens, you have made them bright, precious, and fair. Praise be you, my Lord, through Brother Wind and Air, and fair and stormy, all weathers, moods, by which you cherish all that you have made. Praised be you, my Lord, through Sister Water, so useful, humble, precious, and pure. Praised be you, my Lord, through Brother Fire, through whom you light the night, and he is beautiful and playful and robust and strong. And then it goes on through a few minutes. Mother Earth, and then it ends with something. I once saw a Hallmark card that had the Canticle of the Sun on it, but it left off the, the last line because Hallmark cards don't like paradoxes. Praise be you, my Lord, through Sister Death, from whom no one living can escape. Woe to those who die in mortal sin. Blessed are they. She finds doing your will. How's that for an ending? That's a pretty powerful ending. Yes, uh, which Hallmark could not put on the card, but I, it's, it's very Francis. Very Francis. Yeah, I was just thinking that that canticle, and I highly recommend everybody to Google it and look it up and, and read it because it, it really does capture the essence of of Francis and a very extreme person in his poverty and, and in his mysticism and quite an interesting character as well. So who do you have for us on the next episode? Well, maybe we'll stick with Franciscans for next time and also keep our eyes on, you know, physical phenomena of mysticism because as a 17th century Franciscan nun, Maria de Agreda, who is the most extreme bilocator in Christian history. And she has not been canonized, but she is venerable. But actually she, like Francis, enjoyed other gifts besides bilocation. And to give our listeners a kind of preview of you know what, what these were, she also levitated, but she also had constant visions, actually encounters, uh, with the Virgin Mary, and the Virgin Mary told her the story of her own life. The Virgin Mary told Maria de Agreda the story of her life, the Virgin Mary. That sounds like a very interesting episode. Yep. She wrote a very, very lengthy life of the Virgin Mary. It's just amazing. And uh, it is lengthy. It's about almost a million words long. Well, we promise our listeners not to recite all 1 million words of it. No, it would take months. It definitely would take months. But this has been a fascinating episode, and uh, I can't wait for the next one when we talk about Maria de Agreda and listen to her account of how the Virgin Mary gave her her life story. So until the next episode, thank you for listening to the Christian Mysticism Podcast. If you have any questions for Dr. Ayer, you'll find our email address in the show notes. Just send it over and we'll try to answer it in a future episode. And don't forget to click the subscribe button so you don't miss the next episode of the Christian Mysticism Podcast. <music>